Assalamu alaikum viewers and welcome to this British Muslim TV special coming to you from our studios in Wakefield. Now the Islamic Republic of Pakistan is facing an economic crisis and political disarray following a series of arrest warrants issued for the former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Now over the weekend his property was raided in Lahore and when he attended court on Saturday in Islamabad he faced chaotic scenes at the Islamabad judicial complex. Well, for more on this, on the situation, Imran Khan Saab joins us now from Lahore. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Sir, I'd like to start by asking you, who do you deem to be in control of Pakistan at this time? Well, you know, unfortunately, because the Pakistan democratic system is still evolving, last 60 years, half the time we were ruled by military, martial laws, and half the time by two families. So... Uh, the military is quite entrenched, the military establishment. And we really have to find that balance, you know, if we have to uh, develop as a nation. Unless that balance exists where the elected government, which has the responsibility, also has the authority, uh, rather than the authority lying somewhere else and the responsibility belongs to the elected government, no system can work. You know, even if... It's a factory, even if a factory you separate responsibility and authority, it won't work. Well, this week we saw chaotic scenes and clashes in proximity to your residence at Zaman Park in Lahore and, uh, of course, outside the judicial complex in Islamabad. Now, Cabinet Minister Mariam Aurangzeb claims, and I quote, that you were using party workers, women and children, as human shields to stoke unrest. What's your response to that? Well, first of all, uh, this uh, prime minister was about to be jailed for money laundering. And uh, uh, and also there's a, there was a federal investigating agency which had 16 billion rupees was siphoned off by him and his sons. So he was about to be jailed when the ex-army chief imposed him on the people of Pakistan. And his brother is already convicted and sort of ran away from absconding from justice. So, I mean, this is a criminal family, which along with the Zardari family, they have been looting Pakistan for 30 years. They have corruption cases, you know, that you can write books on that. So when he says that I'm using families, what he's saying is that when he sent the police to abduct me, it was not the police never fulfilled the requirements to come and arrest me. They came to abduct me. It was an illegal address, uh, arrest. I already, I was going to, you know what the whole thing was about? I was supposed to appear in a court on the 18th, on Saturday, which I did appear. On the 14th, the police came to arrest me, to take me to the court, which was on the 18th. So first of all, the whole thing was illegal. There's, there's no way legally they could have used that pretext to come and arrest me. Then they came. I mean, you have never seen such a force. Thousands of policemen and rangers attacking my house from three sides. So quite clearly, people in this country do not think that the police or the, the government is to be trusted because the assassination attempt on me, the government was responsible, the two prime minister, interior minister, and this man from the intelligence agency, uh, the ISI. These three people were involved in my assassination attempt. So people know that they were. this was not some uh, a law they were trying to impose. They were trying to abduct me, to take me into jail, or, or worse, you know, kill me. Uh, because they are the ones who were responsible for my assassination attempt. So there's, there's so much trust deficit with this government. That's why people came forward. And, uh, you know, protested outside my house in front of the police. Well, ultimately, there are over 80 cases filed against you at this time, from blasphemy to terrorism and murder. I mean, if you end up in prison, what next for you and your party? Look, there, I mean, there are close to 100 cases now. Never has this happened in our history before. And remember, this country has known me for 50 years. I've been a a public face in Pakistan for 50 years. So the country knows me. 
They know that I have never, ever broken the law. People trust me. I'm the biggest fundraiser in this country. I've built the biggest charitable institutions, three hospitals and two universities, all for charity. So for them to start calling me a murderer or, or someone who's a, a traitor or a, a blasphemy and even worse, I mean, this uh, terrorist, people don't take this seriously. And, but it's never happened before. Well, on that basis, I think many people fear that Pakistan is potentially on the verge of becoming similar to Sri Lanka. I mean, perhaps even having, dare I say, civil unrest on the streets far worse than we've seen over the last few days. So my question is, does Pakistan's military in any shape or form have the solution or could potentially provide the solution to stabilise the country ahead of this year's general election? Look, you know, Pakistan is descending into a, a situation which I'm really fearful because uh, it could get much worse than Sri Lanka. We are 220 or 30 million people. Sri Lanka is just two and a half million people. Uh, or, you know, something like that. Or No, no, sorry, 20 million people. So 20 million people as opposed to 230 million people. If this goes wrong, it could have repercussions all around, I mean, certainly within Pakistan. And I'm afraid military or no military, no one, if, if this economic chaos keeps going in the direction it is, no one will be able to uh, pick up the pieces. You... So that's why we have wanted elections. All we are saying is to get out of the situation because the government is clueless, has failed badly. No one has confidence in it, whether inside Pakistan or outside. So the only way out are free and fair elections and get a government with public mandate and then allow it to pick up this economy and so that people have confidence, they can plan ahead a five-year term. That's the only, only hope of getting Pakistan out of this mess. Well, who, do, who do you deem to be preventing the elections from happening in the KPK and Punjab uh, assembly regions at this time? I mean, what, what's the holdup? Well, it's all the... 12 parties were in the government right now. All of them are petrified of elections because out of the 37 by-elections we've had in the last eight months, my party has swept 30 of them. And this is despite the establishment backing them and you know the, all the government machinery helping them. Despite that, they've been completely rejected by the people. And that's why they are scared of going to the polls. So they are trying to stop the elections taking place. The Supreme Court has ordered the election of the two provinces, KP and Punjab, which is 66% of Pakistan, or 64%, on the 30th of April. But the government is trying to run away, and certainly the establishment doesn't want elections. So we really have uh, a situation in Pakistan which is, uh, you know, which is unprecedented again. You've never had this situation before. You touched upon the economics of it. It's undeniable that Pakistan's facing an economic crisis at this time. And I have the latest stats with me from Pakistan's Bureau of Statistics uh, reporting uh, as of March the 1st, inflation surging to 31.5%. I mean, that's the highest since 1974. And the nation now risks defaulting on its debts. Hypothetically, sir, if you were given the keys to Prime Minister House tomorrow, now really, what would be your plan to turn around the economy? Well, just for your information, the same economic survey, uh, when it was when it talks about when we were in power, which is in March, and we, we, we left in April. In March, Pakistan's economic performance was the best in 17 years. It had overshot all its targets of exports, of tax collection, of in the industry, industrial growth, the agricultural growth, 4.5%. I mean, every target we had, excelled. In 17 years, it was Pakistan's best economic performance when, through a conspiracy, we were, we were deposed and these criminals were bought, brought back. So since then, the economy has tanked. Pakistan, as you quite rightly say, faces the worst economic situation. And inflation has gone through the roof. It is not just since 74. In 75 years, currently, it, we have the worst inflation in our history. And, you know, the it is quite fearful, the prospects of Pakistan, where do we go from here? So we are in a mess. 
And unfortunately, the government is clueless. It is completely incapable of handling the situation. And uh, uh, the longer we go, the worse the situation gets. Hence, I say that elections are the only solution. We're talking of elections, you know, the biggest rival party to PTI is the New League, PMLN uh, party. Now, former Prime Minister Nawab Sharif Saab has been in London for over three years now. We approached the UK's Home Office for a comment as to his uh, immigration status and as to the reason why he is legally able to stay in this country. Uh, they've refused to comment, but what interest does the UK government have in providing Nawaz Sharif and his uh, family and uh, affiliated uh, members safety in this country? Well, look, the rich countries, the rich countries gain tremendously from money being laundered from poor countries into tax, tax havens or properties in London and so on. Because you know, they have dollars coming in. It's almost like exports. If, you know, that's how your wealth of your country grows if you have exports, you know, when you have dollars coming in. So, I mean, just imagine the amount of money plundered from the developing world by the ruling elites, which goes from the poor countries into rich countries. So London, some of you know, the, the, the biggest crooks in Pakistan have, have bought properties in London, including the Sharifs plus the Zardari family. They have millions and millions of dollars of property in London, money stolen from people of Pakistan. Every year, according to the, the, the Secretary General United Nations FACTI panel, he made a panel of economists to find out why are the poor countries getting poorer and the rich getting richer. And the main reason was that every year, $1.7 trillion leave poor countries, developing countries, and go to offshore tax havens or into rich Western capitals like New York and, uh, and London. So, the, so what is happening is that the rich countries have no incentive to stop this because they're gaining from it. So how can overseas Pakistanis, in your opinion, and the wider Ummah, support Pakistan at this time? The ordinary people, how can they support Pakistan at this time? Well, for a start, they can they talk about and, and talk to the Western politicians in England, everywhere, in Brussels, in New York. They can talk about the, the fascist government that has taken over this country. I mean, total abuse of fundamental rights of people of Pakistan. They have completely desecrated our democracy. There's a complete clampdown on media on journalists. Just now, one of our YouTubers and, and, and a journalist of Bold TV has just been put in, into jail. The stop TV channels that project, uh, that even show me on, on, on their screens, they have killed journalists like uh, Ashit Sharif, the best investigative journalist, hounded out. Three of our best journalists have been hounded out of Pakistan because the, the amount of oppression going on in Pakistan is unprecedented. No democratic government in its history has such sort of oppression. My two of my chief, my chief of staff, uh, uh, Shabazz Gill, and then of course, our Senator Azam Swati were picked up, abducted, custodial torture, stripped naked, tortured, and then presented in front of uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, courts. But don't forget what has happened in here, outside my house. I mean, it was an illegal, totally illegal uh, effort to arrest me. And when it was resisted, I mean, this whole place was like a battleground. Then they broke the door of my house, came in and really stole property, things inside my house when I was away in Islamabad. So these things have never happened in this country before. We have really descended into the worst form of fascism. Uh, and that is a big danger to Pakistan. Because, you, you know, basically all freedoms, all liberties, civil liberties, fundamental rights have been completely abrogated. Since 2020, direct flights between Pakistan and Europe have been significantly reduced. That is primarily due to the state airline PIA having been uh, banned. Now, PIA has passed several international safety audits uh, since then. 
but many analysts, including myself, do not envisage this ban being lifted anytime soon. Uh, given you, you've accused the likes of the United States uh, of political interference within Pakistan, do you regard the ongoing ban as a symbol of incompetence domestically or anti-Pakistan policies being implemented by foreign powers? Well, you know, a bit of both, really. I mean, we did make a few mistakes. But then, um, you know, somehow the conditions were far more harsh on Pakistan than perhaps other airlines. So, um, uh, but, but, you know, basically, we really have to get a house in order. I mean, we have to run Pakistan far better than we've run it so far. And, uh, you know, only a government with a powerful mandate, only that can make the very tough decisions and reforms in Pakistan, which will then lift this country up because it has huge potential. Pakistan is potentially a very rich country. But unless you have the, uh, the, the basis of good governance is rule of law. And our biggest problem is we do not have rule of law. <laughs> and what we are witnessing in Pakistan right now is just the worst form of uh, uh, jung law of the jungle which exists in Pakistan right now. It is totally might is right. The police doesn't listen to the, uh, the verdicts of the, the judiciary. They will barge into your house and the sort of things that are happening, you know, it, it is no country attracts investment unless it has rule of law, which, which brings in good governance, which then creates the enabling environment where you have people investing in country. The, the, the biggest asset of Pakistan overseas Pakistanis. Problem is we just haven't been able to fix our governance system, which is because we don't have rule of law. And then we could attract their investment. And if we could just attract the investment of overseas Pakistanis, Pakistan would not need to go beg borrow money from anyone else. My final question to you, Sarah, is how do you envisage the time now between March and the elections on April the 30th? Uh, surely it can't get worse than it already is. Well, you know, on Saturday when I went to for my court appearance in Islamabad, I thought that the, the maximum they would do is to arrest me. But when I reached that judicial complex and what I saw on the way, uh, I, they had a sinister plan to kill me. And just in time, we, I, we found out and we just got out of the com complex just in time because this government and its handlers were actually trying, were, were going to kill me. They've already tried once. They have they have tried this assassination attempt, and I was lucky to escape with just uh, uh, bullet injuries to my legs. But this was another attempt. But fortunately, uh, it just I discovered this plot in time, and I came out, and uh, and I'm still alive. So look, they are desperate people right now. They are scared that if the elections, I would win, and then they are scared if I win, then they would might hold them accountable for what they've been doing. So they, they, and plus, you know, they have stolen so much money from this country, they're scared of accountability. So therefore they've all ganged up together and they will try everything in their means uh, and they are backed by the establishment. They will try everything in their means so that I don't win the elections or I don't compete in the elections. You know, former Prime Minister of Pakistan and Chairman of PTI, thank you for talking to us exclusively here thank on you. British Muslim TV. Thank you.